It's good to be back. Happy New Year, everyone, in the studio. For my first podcast of the new year, we have The Athletic's Sarah Shepherd and also Ollie Kay, who both dropped a piece on Jordan Henderson that you can read now on The Athletic as well. Right, let's get into this. In September, Jordan Henderson told The Athletic he wanted a move that would excite him. Sarah, when you heard that, and I know it was a groundbreaking interview with both Adam Crafton and David Ornstein, were you sceptical? Um, yes yes and no I think Um, you know this is a player moving somewhere where I I like completely believe that he was sold something that probably did sound very exciting Mm -hmm. you know an opportunity to help build something brand new to be a big part of something that's growing and you know trying to potentially change things in a country that is is telling people it's trying to move in a new direction um so from that side of things maybe he was like maybe he was excited for to, for something new you know he'd been at liverpool for 12 years um and and he clearly felt you know it was time or you know he felt it was the right time for something new um but also from a football sense it, it felt a little bit strange because we knew widely accepted that the level there wasn't going to be anywhere near what he was used to playing at and what he would know that he needs to be playing at to to keep being um at the right level for England um which was obviously important to him so it felt like from the beginning like a contradiction I think (laughs) yeah Ollie what do you think oh I was I was totally skeptical um I don't think it's. I don't think it's an exciting project. I just don't. I mean, I, I, you could say that. You could say the Saudi Pro League project as a whole is exciting. Uh, if you're a player who's been tempted there, or a coach who's been tempted there, but I. I don't think Al Etifak ever looked more than a club really sort of making up the numbers. I think they finished seventh last season. They weren't signing big star names. Henderson was. Probably the biggest of them. Um, Stephen Gerrard was the manager. Obviously, you know St- Stephen Gerrard was managing the Premier League l- last season, but he but he's he's not an elite level manager. The, he wasn't joining elite level players. Um, yes, there was talk of well, yeah, there has been an investment in the club, but football wise, it did not look a remotely <laughs> exciting project. You could say um, you know, there are so many clubs across Europe and across the world that might be an exciting project, but I don't think um, many people thought that Al Etifak was one of them. So I, I'm just left scratching my head to work out what appealed to the move. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at that interview and there were so many quotes you could just pull out that were slightly contradictory, some might say, but in, in fairness, so I'm looking at a player who's, you know, some might say graveyard of his career he's done so much with Liverpool had a fantastic career there he said a totally different league totally different culture I mean surely anyone deserves that opportunity just to taste something new yeah I think graveyard of career at 33 might be <laughs> I don't know I mean obviously he's on the maybe that was a bit obviously too on the, down, too the you know the the downward yeah. side of it um but you know he was incredibly in in great shape everyone saw last summer the work he'd put in mm-hmm. um but like you said, I, 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 it, it, he obviously from that interview that he did with with Adam and um, Orney, he he was clear that he felt he wasn't wanted, he wasn't valued at Liverpool, and that is what drove his decision. Otherwise, he said in that interview he would have stayed if one person had asked him to stay. He would have stayed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that you have to remember that that was his driving emotion and thought when he left. I'm not wanted here. I want to go somewhere where I'm valued where people you know think that I can bring something to them um and that yeah that was his was his driving emotion and he obviously well what he said was that he felt that from our etifac mm. that he was going to be part of something and and that is you know according to him is what what was the driving factor mm. well I guess on a humanist well, level everyone wants to be made to feel special where, wherever they go whatever job you do um but but Ollie uh, he now wants to leave do we know why yeah because he hasn't settled there mm. um I think personally or professionally um his family are out there with him um, I gather his family are living in Bahrain which is just uh, across the bridge from um, from where 
Al Ittifaq play in Damam. Um, yeah, apparently it's, it, it's been very challenging for the family. Um, quite a, an upheaval, quite a culture shock. Not really surprising. I think most people would have said it, it, it will be a, it will be a shock. It will be uh, apart from the heat. It's you know it's it's, it's a totally different existence. Um, and I think professionally, they actually started the season well. They, they beat Cristiano Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo's team Al Nasser in their first game. I think they were, were sort of top three or top four after the first five games, and since then they've really slid. Um, I can't let, let me just. Um, Look, uh, yeah, I, I I can't quite remember the the, the figure, but but yeah, it, it's one win in twelve or one in one in eleven or something like that. They've really dipped. They've had a couple of injuries, and and without Moussa Dembélé, uh, the, one of their star players, they're they're a sort of bang average at best team. Uh, so they slid down the um, they slid down the table, and I think he, from what I gather, he just finds it unfulfilling, unsatisfying, frustrating that he's playing at a low level in front of small crowds um, in a team that's not competitive. Um, and I think so professionally and personally, it looks very unfulfilling. And I'm not really surprised. I, I, I think most people thought it was going to be like that for him. And maybe he thought, maybe he had some measure of understanding about that and thought that, you know, it, it would it would be easier in in some other ways, but whatever whatever the financial incentive was for going there, it feels like it appears that it, it's not worth it mm. for him. That he wants to um, that he wants to come back. First of all, for his family's sake. Second, I think to to kickstart his own career and feel feel a bit more fulfillment, fulfillment professionally. And thirdly, probably just to keep himself at a level where. He's going to be competitive for England for the England squad in the, in the summer because I think, given what we're talking about, playing in an unfulfilled um, team um, at a low level, much lower level than Premier League, it's probably doing more harm to his England chances than, say, a marginal role at Liverpool would have done. Mm. I'm just thinking uh, whether there's a feeling of egg on your face at, at this point, really. Um, and look, every person um, has the opportunity to make a decision and say, you know, they don't want to make that decision or go back on that decision as a human being. But um, I guess with all the PR that, that, that came with it, uh, new league, new project, all the stuff he said to Adam Crafton and David Ornstein to now go back on all of those things and say, oh, I think I want to come back home. I mean, what kind of reception are you expecting if you, if you do come back to England? Yeah, I mean, he's not stupid I'm sure he's aware of how it will look um, and he will I assume have to do some pretty honest talking when he comes back um, if he does come back um, but it, I mean it's almost quite I hesitate to say this because I know people won't, won't feel this way but it's almost quite brave you know to admit that you've you've made a mistake and go back on all of those things it's brave in one way and mm. not in others to go back on that and say actually you know I've made a mistake we all do things that you know we all take jobs or you know make moves that don't go right and like you know maybe it takes resilience to to carry on with that but also sometimes maybe you have to admit that actually it was the wrong decision it was the wrong decision for my career it was the wrong decision for my future as an England player and my chances of playing in the Euros this summer so you know regardless of the implications and how it's going to look and you know the financial implications I, I want to come back and 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 try and put this right mm. um so in some ways it's quite brave although people I know will take issue with that um but yeah it's I mean, when you when you reread the interview that he did with Adam Crafton and David Ornstein and the things that he says in there about wanting to help build a new league and feeling it's, imp you know, he can make a difference, blah, blah, blah. And then th six months later, he's saying, actually, not quite sure about this. Mm. And then, you know, that looks, it doesn't look great in hindsight. Again, we've he, all made he's mistakes. Not, yeah. He's not saying it publicly at the moment. That's that, That's one interesting thing. Um, so I think that would be brave. I think it would be particularly brave to say it publicly if he was back over there for, for a training camp or whatever. It's it's a really difficult situation because, look, people can say, I mean, Jürgen Klopp responded the other day by saying, well, has has 
Jordan Henderson said this in a press conference. No, then I disregard it. But look, I think people, I think people, if they, if they follow football seriously enough to want to listen to this podcast and be interested in journalists, what journalists, journalists think and what people within football think, um, make no mistake, Jordan Henderson wants to go. Um, he hasn't said it publicly, but the, the 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 reports that you've seen over the last couple of days, initially in the Daily Mail, I think, and subsequently in the Athletic and elsewhere, they are very well sourced. So he does want to leave, but whether he actually gets the chance to leave, I don't know. And but I I do agree with Sarah. It, it's because one thing that the, I mean the, these rumours about his disillusionment have been have been sort of blowing around for for a couple of months mm. now. So go back to November but what I was told in November was that look it's a non-starter because he will be he will have to he will have to stay there he he might feel like he's made a mistake in some ways but he's got to write stick it out and he's determined to stick it out and one of the reasons was you know pride one of the reasons was you know honoring a contract um another reason was there was going to be a huge tax bill if he if he came home that was it was t- I, I was told it was going to be very very difficult to come back even even if he wanted to so it, it, it was probably unlikely that he would so um yeah i thought he was going to stick it out and i was quite surprised that it was sort of almost being actively briefed from the henderson camp as of as of the weekend that yeah he does want to come come back because i think still it's it's much easier said or briefed than than done mm. sarah i want to talk to you sorry i've got Bit of a dodgy throw. Um, I want to talk to you about the financial implications in, in just a second because I know you've definitely written on this. But Oli, just a, a, a quick one on that, and just to pick up on something Sarah said about the Euros. You know, you've got the Euros coming up in Germany um, over the summer. Um, it, can this be a factor in, in in why he wants to come back and play competitive football? Um, I know he's spoken about you know not really speaking to you know Gareth Southgate as to whether or not his chances would be affected if he played in Saudi Arabia but Southgate publicly has said you know it, it wouldn't affect his chances but fundamentally he's got to be thinking about that major tournament especially at the age that he's in at this moment in time yeah I think one thing that people might say was is is that Southgate's loyalty to Henderson appears so extreme that he wouldn't he, he wouldn't have any qualms about picking him either way I don't think I don't think Southgate's loyalty has ever been tested, really, because unlike, say, Harry Maguire, um, Henderson has always been playing and, and playing at a good level for Liverpool. Not so great last season, but was still one of Liverpool's more important players last season. So he has always been playing at a level which would justify England's selection. You could also look at, for example, Harry Maguire or Calvin Phillips and say that these guys weren't even playing regularly for their teams or were playing very irregularly, in, infrequently in Calvin Phillips' case, and were still getting in the, in the England squad. One thing which Gareth Southgate said to explain that was that, look, these guys might not be playing every week, but they are still you know, training at a really, really high level amongst elite players, under elite coaches, um, day in, day out, week in, week out. Calvin Phillips might be rusty, but when he when he turns up at England, he he looks capable of doing a job. That has been justified. Likewise with Harry Maguire. If Henderson Henderson is actually playing more regularly than perhaps he would have done if he'd stayed at Liverpool. But if he's training, I mean, if everything we hear from coaches about the importance of keeping your level up and training at a high level, at high intensity, etc., if that's all correct, then it's natural to think that this is having a you know an effect on his performance level, on his fitness level, on, on his, well, probably on his own application, mm. on his mood. So he might turn up at England for England in, in March looking rusty or, or un, untested, I guess, if, he, if he's been training at a low level day in, day out, week in, week out. That might be what concerns him because even if he's playing regularly, I think I think there's probably something, something to be say, said that that a, a week of training under Pep Guardiola at Manchester City, in, in Calvin Phillips's case, is 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 worth <laughs> ten appearances in the Saudi Pro League for Al, for Al Etifak. It doesn't seem to be doing his prospects any good. Put it that way. Yeah, super super quickly, Sarah. Before we move on to the finances, I was just thinking, Liverpool now doing really well in the Carabao Cup um, and various other spaces, not just league football, and for sure 
felt like Jordan Henderson might not have been playing much league football in comparison uh, to where he's at now. Surely, as any human, you're probably looking over the pond thinking, oh man, I, 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 could, I could be in the Carabao Cup right now. I could be potentially lifting a trophy with my old club right now, you know? You would, you would think so. Like, you know, that's a club that clearly was incredibly close to his heart. Mm. You know, his kids were born in Liverpool. He said how, you know, how much he loved the club, which is one of the reasons why he didn't maybe want to move to another Premier League club because he couldn't see himself playing against Liverpool. So, yes, like he must, he must be looking on, thinking there must be an element of, oh, uh, you know, what if I had stayed? But you know, again, I go back to the the Orney and Crafton piece, like he he was clear that he felt there was no desire to keep him there. Mm. And when you feel like that as a person, I think you, you, you know, it, it would have been difficult for him. Maybe, I think Adam said this to him, like in the past, there have been other midfielders that have come into Liverpool and you have risen to the challenge. You know, what was different this time? Mm. And he said that he just felt it was different this time, that he wasn't going to get those opportunities. So... You know, I, I can I can see why emotionally he wanted to get out, but he must now be looking at it thinking, oh, yeah, like maybe maybe I should have stuck it out and seen what, what would have transpired over the course of the, the season. OK, well, let's let's say we do take, as Ollie said, these sources very seriously. Um, what are the implications of him leaving Saudi Arabia, especially if he's to come back to the UK so soon? I'm yeah. talking financials. Yeah, yeah. So tax, um, the tax implications are, are pretty sizable. Um, so uh, as as we understand it in Saudi, um, there is no income tax levied on footballers' wages as long as they stay for two years. Otherwise, there's a 20% tax. Is that right, Ollie? Yeah, I believe so, but you're the authority on this. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to just batter yeah. around you. <laughs> so it, it, that's, that's as we understand it. Yeah. So... Um, but the, the bigger tax implication is in terms of coming back into the UK okay. because um, by by taking a, a full-time job abroad, he basically uh, leaves the UK tax system. But to properly, properly break his UK tax residency, for anybody to properly break their UK tax res- residency, they have to be in full-time employment abroad for that tax year, the rest of that tax year that you move, and then the whole of the following tax year. So for a footballer, it's essentially two seasons. Mm -hmm. So for Jordan Henson, who moved in July 2023, that takes him up to April 2025. Uh, Which obviously, if he returns, you know, in the next few weeks, he's not going to do that. What that means is that when he comes back, the wages that he's earned in Saudi will then come back into the UK tax system because he hasn't properly broken his UK Mm -hmm. tax residency, which means... 45% 45% plus 2% national insurance, which is a very large, you know, it's going to work out to a very large number. Obviously, we don't know exactly what Jordan Henderson's wages are in Saudi. Um, they're reported to be 700,000. Mm-hmm. He's He said, he told us that they were, that was a lot a less. A bit less than that. Um, article. But we don't know exactly what it is. But mm. I mean, I, it's probably fair to say that the number that he will have to pay will be, he will lose millions um, if he comes back within the next few weeks or before before April 2025. Yeah, Ollie, I was just thinking about that. And I mean, look, uh, Jordan Henderson's had a very good career in the Premier League. So if, if his accountants are good and he, he, he looks after his money right, he's still a relatively wealthy man at this point in time. It's just a bit strange, isn't it? Because you've got this one conversation about going to Saudi Arabia for, for, for all the money. But actually, the reality is, has it really been worth it? I think if he's uh, if he's returning home with a with a huge tax bill um, after six months, I think that's not worth it. I think if, if it's if he's um, having to stick out there unhappy and maybe you know family unhappy, I think that's definitely not worth it either. I think it's it's worth it if somebody enjoys it and finds fulfilment and success, but but fulfilment in the in the lives, whether it's personal or professional, but. Yeah, it's looking like a huge mistake at the moment. And to be honest, it looked like a huge mistake at the time. I think more than... You look at Cristiano Ronaldo going out there and he said, well, look, I've done it all in Europe. And there was the fact that Europe's biggest clubs weren't exactly falling over themselves to sign him um, last autumn. But it's, it's broadly true. He has done it all and was probably not able to 
keep doing it at the level he he was at before. Whereas Henderson was in in a situation where I think he made forty three appearances in all competitions for Liverpool last season. Even if you know that they'd signed Chobosley and um, McAllister at the start, the start of the summer, they probably would have signed one more midfielder, whether it was Endo or Gravenberg. Even if his opportunities were reduced this season, he would still have played loads of football for Liverpool. He would still have been captain. He would still have been at the heart of everything they did. I think it was just an incredibly, I think it was a huge mistake in terms of legacy and reputation and brand and all that, but also football-wise. I, I, I just think it's, 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 it's it, the fact that he appears to be desperate to get out after a few months, six months, tells you it was a big mistake. And I think there's a lot of people being quite gleeful about that. But look, it's, it, it's, I think, uh, you know, people say he's, he's a money grabber. Well, if, if he's willing to take a, a huge cut, a huge hit in order to, to, to get back to playing at a, the standard he wants to be playing at and for his family, then, you know, maybe, uh, maybe he's not such a uh, big money grabber after all. I'm just going to throw a few hypotheticals here, really. Um, let's say he does come back t- to the Premier League. And I know in the, um, in the interview, Adam Crafton, mentioned you know you could have considered playing for teams like Brentford or, or Brighton for instance who needs Jordan Henderson's skills right now I mean Sarah would take him at Arsenal <laughs> I would I would um <laughs> you know in light of Thomas Partey's injury injury issues I, I think you know experience like mature head in football terms um I probably would <laughs> I'm not sure that would be echoed by a lot of people though <laughs> Ollie the one that the, the club that sprang to mind the other day when I was thinking about it was um, one which has a big uh, sort of red red cross in, in another way, which is Newcastle. Newcastle are looking for players to sort of help push them on. They're they're trying to improve. They've got very good young players, young midfielders. They've got Tonali suspended long term. They've got all these injuries. Eddie Howe is very big on mindset, mentality. Um, it's in the northeast. Oh yeah, good uh, point. Good point. But the fact that it's in the northeast is is almost a, a red flag because he's from he's from Sunderland. He's a big, you know, huge Sun, Sunderland. I, I, well, I'm not sure he supports Sunderland as a boy. I might query that, but but he but you know, he, he he's very much a Mackham in, in in you know from a northeast perspective. Um, I'm inclined to say I can't see that happening purely on, you know, Newcastle Sunderland grounds, Tyne, Tyne Weir um, grounds. Mm. But, you know, if you're willing to leave Liverpool to go to Al Etifak, you're probably willing to do, <laughs> and you've made him start. You, you, you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure he would be willing if it came to that. If Newcastle was was on the table, I, I think he'd probably jump at it in some ways. But I. As things stand on January, what is it, January the 10th, I think it just looks incredibly difficult for him to get out. So we're, we're, we're rightly and we're rightly speculating about what might happen, which clubs might be interested. And I'm, I'm sure there is interest. But whether he can actually get out and get the move he wants, I don't know, easy, easier said than done. Yeah, I'm just thinking if the Premier League, Sarah, isn't an option and he's thinking about this sort of tax burden as well. Any other countries where you can sort of see this happening? You know, Spain, France, I mean, any other European countries that could allow him to, you know, how can I say, flesh out that tax burden? Yeah, yeah. So there are there are ways around it. And one of those is you know, going to another country to mm-hmm. see out that, you know, till he's properly broken the UK tax residency. So that could mean Spain, Holland, France. Um, there are reports that Ajax are keen on him, but whether <laughs> the feeling is mutual, we don't know. Yeah. Um, so yes, that would be a way around it. Um, if if he is, as Ollie says, mm. allowed to leave, I, I think that is the going to be the you know the biggest obstacle really, because from a Saudi perspective, how does it look and what does it say to these other players that you're going to be targeting next summer? Mm. These big big names that we know that they want to bring in next summer. What does it say to them um, when a player of of Henderson's sort of standing and fame um, after six months he's saying get me out of here um, 
yes, he's only he's only one player. We have to remember that. And you know, we've seen in the past players move to the Premier League from other countries and and don't settle and and return. So that's you know that that happens. Um, but I think the Saudis will feel that it, it doesn't send you know the message that they really want to be sending ahead of what what they would view as another big summer for them. Yeah, I was thinking about what you were saying there, um, and. I don't know, sometimes I sort of have to take my Western hat off because I feel like we're all waiting for the, the Saudi bubble to burst, Oli. Uh, like, but Sarah is right. What does this say about a league that's trying to compete with all these other leagues and it's still fundamentally a startup that you lose someone of the experience, an England international in the likes of Jordan Henderson so soon? Yeah. I think I think one thing you've got to say is that English players have very often not travelled well. They've not they're not good. You know, English footballers are not renowned for being good travellers the way, for example, French and uh, Brazilian and, and Portuguese players are. Cristiano Ronaldo seems to be living with it, enjoying it, sort of thriving in terms of scoring a lot of goals and um I, you know I, I wrote about Cristiano Ronaldo's first year there um and despite some inevitable teething problems he's been enjoying it Karim Benzema hasn't been enjoying it Jordan Henderson hasn't but I think you know I, I think there are a lot of players who come to England large you know come to the Premier League because that's where the money is and they set, and and whether they settle or not they they live with it in most cases, I think there'll be a lot of players in Saudi Pro, Saudi Pro League who probably don't like elements of of it, but but will probably live with it. I think if if you know we we know Henderson's not happy. We understand Benzema has has had a few difficulties, and um, I think if if it's more than that, more than sort of two players in the in amongst that first big wave, I think then that becomes really problematic problematic um sort of brand wise for for Saudi Arabia I think it's problematic if they let them go because I think it probably almost encourages an exodus amongst amongst any un- unhappy players and it's also problematic if you keep players against their will I think I, I think there's no really particularly good outcome for for, for Saudi for the Saudi Pro League mm. from this point um if, if players are unhappy yeah, I, you know, saw you nodding at a few of those points there, Sarah. Also thinking about the, the bigger implications of this, right? Like the World Cup's on its way. So everything's sort of gearing up towards Saudi being one of the central stages. We looked at, you know, uh, the Spanish Cup was recently played there. Like, you know, being the centre of football in prowess towards 2034. Can they afford to have anything chink that armour? Because, I mean, Cristiano Ronaldo... It's, it's it's all about brand Ronaldo, but it's all the other players fundamentally that are going to keep this league competitive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the optics is I think some brand people like to say the optics don't look good. <laughs> um, as Ollie says, if it's if it's more than two players and this becomes a running theme, um, then they will they will be concerned, and I, I imagine that they will be. You know, there will be meetings and meetings going on at the moment, um, whether those are with Jordan Henderson or without him, to try and decipher, you know, how they can fix this, how what they can do to to make his stay in Saudi, you know, more pleasurable. Like, and like like you said, it, it you know, they're they're all about 2034. Like, it's it's so important to them to to show that Saudi is capable of. Um, you know, being the place for for football going forward, and I think if if this starts to become, like I said, a running theme, then then there there'll be huge concerns over there, and and they hopefully, or I'm sure they will be trying to figure out what they can do to try and change that. Mm. Like it's really interesting, or well, I think it's really interesting. Question is is whether if Al Etifak were being more successful on the pitch, would that change things? Yeah, I like. I don't know. I mean, obviously, he's been part of teams in the past that haven't always been successful, and you you deal with that as a footballer. That's part of it. But maybe it's different when you are, you know, in Liverpool. You're at home in England, and you have other things around you to support you through those difficult times. Whereas being in a you know country, a new country that that's so different to your home country, 
um, and having those problems on the pitch, maybe you don't feel the you know, foundations are there to support you through that. But that, yeah, that's I know, a different t- subject, but I find it quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, but I just always think that that's the that's the life of an, of an expat, isn't it? Like you're you're living away from your creature comfort. It's how you adapt mm. to that country as opposed yeah. to how that country adapts to you in many respects. But yeah, again, we're talking about footballers who are on serious, serious money. Um, I'm just thinking, Ollie, it's probably maybe a question for David Ornstein, but do we even have any sniffs as it's January of any sort of stars from Europe being looked at th- this month? Obviously, the European transfer window is opening through this month. It's interesting, isn't it? It's been very quiet so far. Mm. Um, and that has been in, in keeping with what we were told after the after the summer transfer window closed, that, that look, this was, this was necessary. This was a necessary mass investment. Um, but January will be quiet. Um, I was a little bit sceptical about that at the time because, you know, the, the, easy to forget now, but, but clubs were, or, well, the, the league and the, um, and, the, um, and the authorities there were very much pushing for Mo Salah right up against the, mm. you know, the, going to the final 48 hours of the, um, the, the summer transfer window. I felt at that point, well, they're going to come back from in January, aren't they? But, um, but so far they haven't. He's gone away to Afghan. Um, it's all very quiet, and no, I, I, I've not really heard of of, of much at all um, in January. What I what I have heard is is of um, clubs with with <laughs> aging, very expensive players uh, looking, thinking that that they might um, palm a few of them off to Saudi Arabia, thinking that oh, this is, that they'll, they'll be good for the you know. Taking taking some um, some of our sort of fading players off the wage bill, but not really getting much encouragement mm. so far, which I think is interesting. It suggests that perhaps they're not going to try to make statement signings the way they did in in in, in the summer market. That they're, they're perhaps realizing that that their intake in the summer was was very much aging, very expensive, big name players, um, and that in order to be in a good place in two, three, four years' time. They're going to have to look at younger players, and I, I think maybe that's what they, what they will do in in um, you know probably in, probably in the summer. But I think, as we said again, it, it it doesn't help if players who are going there um, are sort of um, feeling after six months that they've made a big mistake. Mm-hmm. One of the things that is interesting is. Um that from next season, the the limit on the number of uh, foreign players allowed per team will, will go up to 10. At the moment, it's limited to eight, and a lot of the clubs have already filled those quotas, mm. which is one of the reasons why a lot of people were expecting January to be quiet. But yeah, from the start of next season, those clubs will have two more foreign places they can fill. Um, so that will be, I think, that's why I think their focus is really on, on going big again next summer. Mm. Well, let's wait till that summer then and maybe, I don't know, you start the petition for Henderson to come back to Arsenal, Sarah. <laughs> come to Arsenal, I should say. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for your time and don't forget you can read both their pieces on The Athletic right now. And also, please remember to rate and review this podcast if you are enjoying it. That's £2 or $2 a month for 12 months. Thanks so much for listening. If you like this video, click subscribe for more content like this. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Karl Lanka, and plenty more through the season to bring you the inside track to the biggest stories in football. If you'd like to listen to the full episodes for free, search The Athletic Football Podcast wherever you get your podcasts from.